Hello, this is Ana Dominguez, your language coach. Today, we are going to read the chapter one from the novel. Remember, I have already read the chapter two, Pigweed Society. I have explained what is the theater play they are rehearsing that uh, obviously Joe wrote. But in the chapter one, um, this is a fantastic chapter where the, 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 the family is being introduced. So let's start with this. I am showing you here our poster. Uh, I'm creating a theater group in English. It's called English Through Theater. And this academic year till December 2023, we will be adapting this magnificent uh, play uh, and novel into a play, into a theater play. And, and we are also reading the script from 1994, uh, the version where Winona Ryder was in. Um, in my website, you can find the two last movies from 2019 and 1994. So you can watch it there in English, that, those two movies in order to get familiarized with this atmosphere, this world of little women. Let's start with the novel. I have to say, and I have placed here, this is a picture I took here in San Lorenzo de Escorial in front of the Coliseum, the uh, Charles III uh, Coliseum or Carlos III. It's that that door belongs to the theater and, and I like it because of the color. And I place there the book, this same book that I have here with me because it's not by chance that they appear with dressed as a pilgrim, pilgrims. Um, this is important because they have received the other book that I also have that is called The Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, the four little girls re receive as a present this, this book from the mom. And it's something that they used to also kind of, uh, it, it was a game that they were doing when they were little, but also the mother is also mentioning this book in this chapter in the novel, in the first chapter of the novel. So very important, John Bunyan was um, someone that we could say was a priest in the 17th century, I think it was 16th or 17th century. And he was uh, writing this story that is talking about the Christianity and actually the main character is called Christian. He is leaving his family, children and wife uh, behind and he's uh, he has decided to leave the city of the destruction and he is willing to find the, the celestial city. And in this path, it encounters many different characters and many different circumstances and, and, and difficulties. So he he's challenging himself with this uh, pilgrimage. And, and, and also we, we know that the second book from the Pilgrim's Progress is the family, so kids and the wife, going after him and following the same uh, journey till they reach the celestial city and they see each other there in the celestial city. So this is a symbolic uh, no, uh, book, a very symbolic book that people knew very well in that time and that people know that nowadays. And uh, it's, I think it's, it was a bestseller, you know, in that time, probably uh, it was probably sold as, as good as the Bible in, that, in those times. Um, so just, I want you to know this because everything, um, it makes sense. It happens also, I have to say that uh, March also is not only the month, uh, the family March is also, March means marching, it's it being in movement and walking towards some uh, destiny. So this is very interesting how the names also make reference to this, um, to this pilgrim's progress. Um, I have to say as well that, um, um, I was going to say that in our place, the place where we are going to do the rehearse, we are doing the rehearsal, rehearsings uh, and rehearsals, we are uh, in a place that is called Paseos, and it was by chance because I was searching for a, a, a for a place in the in the town to to be to gather this group, and it happens that it is called Paseos, and I think that is the best name for 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 
uh, studying this novel and studying uh, the, the, the universe of Little Women. So let's start with this. Um, the preface says, go then, my little book, and show to all that entertain and bid thee welcome shall what do does keep you keep close shut up in their breast and wish that do does show them may be blessed to them for good may make them choose to be pilgrims better by far than thee or me tell them of mercy she is one who early hath her pilgrimage begun dear let young damsels learn of her to prize the world which is to come and so be wise for little tripping maids may follow God along the ways which saintly feet have trod. Adapted version, this preface um, from the Pilgrim Progress uh, by John Bunyan. Uh, so well, interesting that you see how is the, this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, is all the time like that. It's written in verse, it's using the the, though, have, you know, this word, this vocabulary, that is the typical vocabulary from ancient English. Uh, so it's something a bit more difficult for us, uh, not only for native English speakers, but especially for people like us that we are bilingual and we are, it's our second language. English is our second language. So imagine an English studying Lope or an English man or woman studying um, Calderón de la Barca. So it would be something like that, okay? So it's, it's, um, it's a, a universe, it's a poetic language and it's also very symbolic. And at the same time, the, the words, are very formal and and they, it's a, it's a, as I told you it's a ancient English so that's why it can be a little bit even farther from our taste or your taste. I like it. I personally like it. Um, if you get familiarized with him, you will understand also uh, Shakespeare because they, Shakespeare also wrote in verse and it appears a lot of rhymes and a lot of words, very technical words from that time that it will help you definitely to understand um, each other. No? So if you study John Bunyan, you are going to understand also very well a Shakespeare uh, theater play, because it's like that. It's a complex, it's difficult, but it has um, a treasure that must be found. So let's continue with the second part. Well, no, this is the preface. Um, Let's continue over here. It says um, the ch chapter one. So Christmas, Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rag. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darken, darkened again, as Joe said sadly. We haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but it silently added it. Thinking of father far away where the fighting was where the fighting was. Nobody spoke for a minute. Then Meg said in, a, in an altered tone, you know the reason mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone and she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I am, a, I am afraid I don't. And Meg shook her head as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. Um, I'm not going to stop in every word that I have highlighted in pink, but I guess that the, I have already guessed that 
if you are an advanced or first certificate or even proficiency level um, Spanish speaker, um, if you are in that range from B, B2 up to C2, you are probably going to have problems or not only with the meaning, but sometimes also with the phonetics. So that's why I have highlighted certain expression and cer certain words. But I'm not going to explain because this, this is a long uh, reading. So let's continue with that. I, I leave you the task of searching for the word. Let's continue with the next part. But I don't think the little, and excuse me, other four, yes, is this one. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar and the army wouldn't be much helped by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy and Dean and Centrum for myself. And Andin and Centrum is a literary work, it's a book. I've wanted it so long, said Joe, who was a bookworm. I plan to spend mine in new music, said Beth, with a little sigh, which no one heard but the heart rush and kettle holder. I shall get a nice box of Faber's draw, drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. Mother didn't say anything about all our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Jo, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentle, gentlemanly manner. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have such a have a have you don't have such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps out who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied and worries you till you have you are ready to fly out the window or cry. It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work, is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross and my hands get too stiff, get, get so stiff. I can't practice well at all. And Beth looked at her rough hands with a sigh that everyone could hear that time. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy, for you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and levels, your father if he is, isn't rich, and insult you when, you, when your nose it's a, it's a nice. If you mean a level, I, I'd say so and not talk about levels as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe laughing. And here, Joe is also um, working with the, with the sound and making like a tongue, to, tongue twister. Mm, I know what I mean, and you needn't be sat satirical, and that's uh, the wrong way of saying it. Uh, satirical, not satirical, satirical about it, it's proper to use good, good, good words, good words, and improve your vocabulary. Return Amy with dignity. And vocabulary and statistical are words. That obviously, you can see that Amy is saying it wrong. Um, don't peck at one another, children. Don't you wish we had the money, Papa lost? Oh, Papa, they used to say Papa, okay? Papa lost when he, we were little, Joe. Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries, said Meg, who could remember better times. You said the other day you thought we were a deal happier than the king children, for they were fighting and fretting all the time in spite of, our, of their money. 
So I did, Beth. Well, I think we are, for though we do have to work, we make fun of ourselves and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy, with a repro reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rag. Joe immediately sat up, put her hands in her pockets and began to whistle. Don't, Joe, it's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude and ladylike girls. I hate I hate affected mini mini ni mini chits. Ni mini pimini chits. Um mini, I guess it's with the stress at the beginning. Ni mini pimini chits. I hate affected ni mini pimini chits. Birds in their little nests agree, sang sang but bed. Birds in their little nest agree, sang Beth, the peacemaker, with such a funny face that both sharp voices softened to a laugh, and the pecking ended for the time. Really, girls, you are both to be blamed, said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elder sisterly fashion. You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better, Josephine. It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl, but now you are so tall and turn up your hair. You should remember that you are a young lady. I'm not. And if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm 20, cried Joe, pulling off her net and shaking down a chestnut mane. Mane is melena, vale? Chestnut is like the color. I hate to think I've got to grow up, grow up and be Miss March and wear long gowns and look as prim as China Astor. It's hard, it, it's bad enough to be a girl anyway, when I like boys games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy. And it's worse than ever now for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa. And I can only, I can only stay home at night, and I can only stay home at night like a pocky old woman. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the net needles rattled, rattled like castanets. Rattled is we're moving and, and touching each, each other like castanets, castanets, castañuelas, castan, eh, vale? And her ball rounded across the room. Poor Joe, it's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and boyish and playing brother to us girls, said Beth, stroking the rough head with a hand that all the dish washing and dusting in the world could not make un ungentle in its touch. As for you, Amy, continued Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose. If you don't like, if you don't take care, I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant, but your absurd words are as bad as Joe's lungs. Joe's lang. Okay, so remember, Joe is always talking in that way, using slang words, and Amy is is because she's the 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 smallest and the youngest. We could say she's the youngest. Uh, she's having problems with the vocabulary. So more or less, what we could also feel when we are speaking in a second language that is not your native mother language. Okay, um, so sometimes we are using absurd words as well because we make we made up or because we misuse the word we place it in a word in the in, in a sentence that it shouldn't be there that way um, so this is what uh, meg is saying to them if yo is a tomboy and amy a goose what am i please asked beth ready to share the lecture you are a dear and nothing else answered meg warmly and no one contradicted her for the mouse was the pet of the family 
as young readers like like to know how people look, we will take this moment, and this is Luisa May Alco talking here, as young readers like to know how people look, we will take this moment to give them a little sketch of our four sisters who sat knitting away in the twi twilight while the December snow fell quietly without and the fire crackled cheerfully within. So remember that um, also in those times, the descriptions were very important because then later people were um, illustrating their own books or making their own pictures of the characters. So that now it's about, this, she's going to describe physically in appearance, the characters. It was a comfortable, it, it was a comfortable room though the carpet was faded and the furniture very plain for a good picture of two hung or, or, or two a good picture or two hung on the walls books filled their recesses chrysanthemums and christmas rose bloomed in the windows and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it margaret the eldest of the four was 16 and very pretty, being plumped and fair, with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, a sweet mouth, and white hands, of which she was rather vain. Fifteen-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and brown, and reminded one of a, a colt, for she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. She had a, a decided mouth, a comical nose, and sharp gray eyes, which appeared to see everything and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Her long, thick hair was her own, was her one beauty, was her, was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled into a net to be out of her way. Round, shoulders had joe big hands and feet a flyaway look to her clothes and the uncomfortable appearance of a girl who was rapidly shooting up into a woman and didn't like it elizabeth or beth as everyone called her was a rosy smooth hair haired bright-eyed girl of 13 with a shy manner a timid voice and a peaceful expression, which was seldom disturbed. Her father called her Little Miss Tranquility, and the name suited her excellently. For she seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only venturing out to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person, in her own opinion, at least a regular snow maiden with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender, and always carrying herself like a young lady, mindful of her manners. What the characters of the four sisters were, we will leave to be found out. The clock struck six, and having swept up the, the hearth, and I'm going to say what is the hearth. The hearth is the part of the fireplace that is extended, in, extended on the floor beside the uh, fire, fireplace, okay? So that's the hearth. Uh, Beth put a pair of slippers down to warm, to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls. Her mother was coming and everyone brightened to welcome her. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked and Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up and to, told, to hold the sleepers nearer to the blaze. And the blaze, remember, is the, the fire. No? La lumbre, podemos decir. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some, some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, I cried, uh, cried Amy. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, be began Meg, but Joe cut in 
cut in with a decided, I'm the man of the family now, Papa is away, and I shall provide the slippers for he told me to take special care of mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, said Beth. Let's each get her something to for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That like you, dear. What will we get? exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute, then Meg announced as if the, the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands. I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, army shoes best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs all hemmed, and hemmed means um, con, con ribete, ¿vale? said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of Colang. She likes it and it won't cost much. So I have some left to buy my pencils, added Amy. How we will give the things, asked, asked Meg. Put them on the table and bring her in and see her, her open the bundles. Bundles son como los paquetes, ¿no? los regalos, the bundles. Usually before it was made also with cloth, not only with paper, but also cloth. So they were kind of um, putting everything together and making a little, a little bundle like that. Don't you remember how we used to do on our birthdays? Answered Joe. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the chair with the crown on. And this reminds me of um, the, you know, in Waldorf education, they usually celebrate uh, the, the birthday, birthdays like this. They use a crown and they celebrate it in, celebrate it in a special way. And this reminds me of that, uh, with the crown on. And see you all come marching around to give the presents with a kiss. I liked the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles, said Beth, who was toasting her face and the bread for tea at the same time. <laughs> Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves and then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do about the play for Christmas night, said Jo, marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. I don't mean to act any more after this time. I'm getting, I'm getting too old for such things, observed Meg, who was a much, who was as much a child as ever about dressing up frolics. And dressing up frolics is this, the customs that you wear when you are acting, right? Um, so you won't, you won't stop, I know, as long as you can trail around in a white gown with your hair down and wear gold paper jewelry. You are the best actress we've got and there'll be an end of everything if you quit the board, said Joe. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and do the fa fainting scene, for you are as, as stiff as a poker in that. I have to mention, if you want to know what's the theater play that they are rehearsing, go to this link that I, I will probably place somewhere here, uh, because I um, I there I'm reading the, the chapter two, where it appears the Pickwick Society and the theater play. And I continue reading. I, I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint. And I don't choose to make myself all black and blue, tumbling flat as you do. If I can go down easily, I'll drop. If I can't, I shall fall into a chair and be graceful. I don't care if Hugo, who was the, one of the protagonists of the story that Joe has written for the Christmas theater play that they are rehearsing, Hugo does come at, I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol, returned Amy, who was not gifted with dramatic power, but was chosen because she was small enough to be borne out stricken by the billion of the peas. Do it this way, clasp your hands, clasp is to do this, put together your hands, and uh, uh, clasp, your hands so, de esta manera, so, 
and stagger across the room, crying frantically, Rodrigo, save me. And remember, this, nosotros diríamos Rodrigo, but in this case is Rodrigo. Save me, save me. And away went Joe with a melodramatic scream, which was truly thrilling. Amy followed, but, the, but she poked her hands out stiffly before her and jerked herself along as if she went by machinery and her out was more suggestive of pins being run into her than of fear and anguish. Joe gave a dispar despairing groan and Meg laughed outright, outright, while Beth let her breath burn as she watched the fan with interest. It's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes. And if the audience laughs, don't blame me. Come on, Meg. Then things went smoothly for Don Pedro, defied the world in a speech of two pages without a single break. Hagar, the witch, chanted an awful incan incan incantation over her kettle full of simmering toads with weird affect. Roderigo rent his chains asunder mindfully, and Hugo died in agonies of remorse and arsenic with a wild ha ha. It's the best we've had yet, said Meg, as the dead billion sat up and rubbed his elbows. I don't see how you can write and act such splendid things, Joe. You are a regular Shakespeare, exclaimed Beth, who firmly believed that her sisters were gifted with wonderful genius in all things. Not quite, replied John modestly. I do think the witch's curse and operatic tragedy is rather a nice thing, but I like to try Macbeth. If we only had a trapdoor for Banku, bank I always wanted to do the killing part. Is that a dagger that I see before me? muttered Jo, rolling her eyes and clutching at, at the air as she has seen a famous tragedy tragedian do. No, it's the toasting fork with mother's shoe on it instead of the bread. Met the stage, met the stage track, cried Meg, and the rehearsal ended in a general burst of laughter. Glad to find you so merry, my girls, said a cheery voice at the door. And actors and audience turned to welcome a tall, motherly lady with a with a can I help you look about her wig, which was truly delightful. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble-looking woman, and the girls thought the grey clock and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. Well, they uh, there is, well, there is how. How have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to, to go tomorrow that I didn't come home dinner to dinner. Has anyone called Beth? How is your cold bed, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While making this maternal inquir inquiries, Mrs. March got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about, trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. Meg arranged the tea table, Joe brought wood, wood and set, chair, set chairs, dropping, overturning, and cluttering everything sh she touched. Beth trot, trotted, or trotted, two and four between parlor kitchen, quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone as she, as she sat with her hands folded. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said with a particular happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine, a streak, a streak of sunshine. Beth 
clapped her hands regardless of the biscuit, biscuit she held. And Joe to to tossed up her napkin crying, a letter, a letter, three cheers for father. Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks, thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and, and a special message to you girls, said Mrs. March, Pat in her pocket, Pat is doing like that, as if she had got a treasure, a treasure there. Hurry and get done. Don't stop to quirk your little finger and simper over your plate, Amy, cried Joe, choking on her tea and dropping her bread butter side down on the carpet in her haste to get at the treat. Beth ate no more, but crept away to sit in her shadowy corner and brought over the delight to come till the others were ready. I think it was so splendid in father to go as chaplain, and chaplain is a, is a kind of a, cler a clergy member, that goes with the army, okay? So that's why he is going to marry also uh, his uh, elder sister, Meg. So he is a clary man, you could say. Uh, so he went there as, a, as chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg warmly. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer, a vivan, what's its name? Or a nurse, so I could be near him and help him, explained Joe with a groan. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear. Unless he is sick, he will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can. And we won't ask him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire, mother in the big chair with Beth at her feet, make an Amy perch on e either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back where no one could see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those with fathers sent home, those which fathers sent home. In this one little uh, was said of the hardship endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter, full of lively descriptions of camps, camp life, marches, and military news. And only of the, at the end did the writer's hearts overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. Give them all, the, all my dear love and a kiss. Give them all of my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their actions at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work so that these hard days need to be, need to be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies, bosom is like intimate, okay? Bosom enemies bravely and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they come to that part. Jo wasn't ashamed of the great tear that dropped off her, off the end of her nose, and Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out. I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me by any by. 
We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't anymore if I can help it. I'll try and be what he loves to call me, a little woman, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else, said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing but wiped away her tears with the blue army sock and began to knit with all her might, losing no time in doing the duty that lay nearest her, while she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all that father hoped to find her when the deer brought round the happy coming home. Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were little things? Nothing delighted you more than to have me tie my pieces bag, my piece bags on your backs for bargains, give you hats and sticks and rolls of papers of paper, and let you travel through the house from the cellar, from the cellar, which was a city of destruction, up up to the house top where you had all the lovely things you could collect to make a celestial city. So remember, I have explained before, The Pilgrim's Progress. So The Pilgrim's Progress is the book that I have already mentioned before. And they are playing, they were used, they used to play this, this uh, the, the, the narration of this story in their own home. Uh, so Mrs. Mar that's, why, that's why Mrs. March is talking about this book. Um, and, and, and Luisa May Alcott has already described from which place this, the cellar up to the um, to the um, the house top um, where they have the the celestial city. What fun it was, especially going by the lions fighting Apollyon and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were," said Joe. "I like the place." where the bundles fell off and tumbled downstairs, said Meg. And there is a passage in this narration where the bundles is one moment where he, the uh, Christian, the protagonist of the, of, of the Pilgrim's Progress, is being helped and the bundle is, we could say it's like, it's like the, the backpack that he is carrying with him uh, falls and is being liberated by that. I don't remember much about it ex except that I was afraid of the cellar and the dark entry and always liked the cake and milk we had up at the top. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it over again, said Amy, who began to talk of renouncing childish things at the mature age of 12. We never are too old for this, my dear, because it is a play we are all the time in one way or another. We are playing all the time in one way or another. Out burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace, which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrims, suppose you begin again, not in play, but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before father comes home. So it's interesting how the mother is saying, well, life is full of difficulties as well as in this book that we read and we used to play as a game. Uh, it's beautiful the way Lisa May Alcott has been, you know, placing these symbols and, and needs, you could say. Really, mother? Where are our bundles, asked Amy, who was a very literal young lady. Each of you told what you bar your burden was just now, except Beth. I rather think she hasn't got any, said her mother. Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters and envying girls with nice pianos and being afraid of people. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everyone, everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did for it would have hurt her feelings very much. Let us do it, said, said Meg thoughtfully. 
it is only another name for trying to be good. And the story may help us, for though we do want to be good, it's hard work and we forget and don't do our best. We were in this love, in this love of this pond tonight, and mother came and pulled us out as help in as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions like Christians. What shall we do about that? As yo delighted with the fancy which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty. Look under your pillows Christmas morning and you will find your white book, replied Mrs. March. So she's going to give them as a present the Pilgrim Progress book. They talked over the new plan while old Hannah cleared the table. Then out came the four little work baskets and the needles flew as the girls made sheets for Aunt March. So they are sewing and decorating the sheets that they are going to give it as a present uh, to Aunt March. It was an interesting sewing, but tonight no one grumbled, obviously after they have been inspired by the, the letter. They adopted Joe's plan of dividing the long scenes into four parts and calling the quarters Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, and in that way got, an, got on capitally, especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. At nine, they stopped work and sang as usually as usual before they went to bed. No one but Beth could get much music out of the old piano, but she had a way of softly touching the yellow keys and making a pleasant accompaniment a com yeah, accompaniment to the simple songs they sang. Meg had a voice like a flute and she and her mother led the little choir. Amy chirped like a cricket and Joe wandered through the airs at her own sweet will. <laughs> sweet will, very interesting. No? So, dulce voluntad. Always coming out at the wrong place with a croak or a qu uh, quiver. Uh, so I'm going to explain uh, croak is como graznido, vale? And uh, qu qu uh, qu um, quiver, it's also, uh, could also be called the, uh, una corchea, vale? I think. That is spoiled the most pensive tune. And pensive is, uh, we could say also like um, pensativa, no? Pensive tune or thoughtful tune. They had always done this from the time they could they could they could lisp. And I'm going to say this is a references of one very common lullaby, but they use it in their own in their own way. So it, they it says crinkle crinkle little tar. And I'm going to explain usually it's twinkle twinkle little star, right? But they are saying crinkle crinkle little tar. And I'm going to say it uh, here that crinkle is arruga. Ital viene de little and tar also if you look for the word tar literally it's um eh, es como betún o brea vale but this is not it's I think it's because they are breaking or they are um, contracting like when they were kids and when they were little eh, little little star vale so crinkle crinkle because it seems Twinkle, twinkle is similar to that, and they used to change the words. So it's very interesting how it's been shown here how the evolution of the language, right, from when we are little up to when we are old. And sometimes the, the way that kids talk is so funny and so cute that you don't want to change the mistakes. Uh, and it had become a household custom, and household here means hogareña, vale, una costumbre hogareña for the mother was a born singer. The first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house singing like a lark and a lark here is una alondra, vale, porque I want to say it because I know that this might be very specific. And the last sound at night was the same cheery sound for the girls never grew too old for that familiar lullaby. This is it. Uh, we have finished reading the first chapter 
in the novel. Remember, this is the novel and we are reading it together. Recommendations, go through the, um, the video, taking notes of the words. And if you have the book, read it along uh, as well. Um, maybe in, you could record one page or two and send it to me if you are my coach here already. So have a fantastic day. I'll see you soon. Um, and if you are, if you want to participate in the reading uh, sessions, I mean, in those people that can't be part of the theater group, but they want to support us and help us, you are welcome to participate in the reading sessions that I do online every Friday. So just contact me um, uh, through my website or in my, on my through the email. Send me an email telling me that you would, uh, would like to participate and let's book a, a time to have a, a reading of, of a scene with you. Have a fantastic day. See you soon. Bye.